On this Wednesday night, chaos, confusion, and cancellations. The American system-wide outage that grounded thousands of flights and stranded millions of travelers. We've been delayed three times. How vulnerable is Canada to something similar? California gets a brief break, the cleanup, but the warning of what's on the way. A critical court ruling on indigenous lobster fishing rights. Oh, well, it means a lot. The next step First Nations could take. Plus, escaping Afghanistan to start over in Canada. God gifted me a second chance. Two girls celebrate the freedom and independence they thought was impossible. Global National with Donna Friesen. Good evening and thanks for joining us. We begin tonight with the impact of a system-wide failure in the U.S., causing thousands of flight delays and cancellations. A computer system that alerts pilots to potential hazards went down overnight, and the Federal Aviation Administration grounded nearly all planes across the U.S. The system is working again, but the ripple effect has led to a huge backlog of flights. President Joe Biden has ordered a full investigation, though the White House says there's no evidence of a cyber attack. More than 9,000 flights within two or out of the U.S. are delayed, at least 1,300 canceled. Among the hardest hit is Baltimore Washington Airport. Nearly half of all arrivals and departures there are delayed. All of this also had a, an effect on cross-border travel to and from Canada. We'll get to that in just a moment, but we begin with Jackson Prosco on what went wrong. Departure boards tell the story of a day of travel chaos. It says cancel. Okay, you're just finding that out now? Yes, literally just now. For almost two hours, nearly all commercial air traffic in and into the U.S. was grounded by a computer failure. This morning when we woke up, we heard the news, so we thought we're just going to rent a car and not fly. By the time the system came back online, it was clear travel plans for millions were scuttled, with thousands of flights either delayed or canceled. Charlie and Joan Brown's overnight trip was up in the air. They were not. We were completely surprised, and I have a flight out tomorrow at 9 a.m. Do you think things will be back to normal by then? That's already, they're saying that's, that's canceled. The headaches weren't limited to American airspace. Many U.S.-bound flights from Canada were delayed or canceled as well. Frustration quickly spilled over the border. Confused, yes. Stressed out, yes. Tired, yes. But I'd rather be safe than sorry. The culprit was a crash of a computer system used by the U.S. Federal Aviation Administration known as Notice to Air Missions, or NOTAM. NOTAM gives pilots critical safety information about U.S. airport and airspace operations, details they need before takeoff. A critical system like this has a lot of redundancy built into it with backups, so we need to understand why with uh, all of that redundancy it still rose to the level uh, that there had to be a ground stop. Americans and Canadians have faced plenty of travel frustration in the last few weeks, with bad weather and airline computer problems stranding thousands over the holidays. We've had a lot of airport issues this season. Officials insist there's no indication of a cyber attack or sabotage in Wednesday's incident, but there will be an investigation into the largest ground stop of U.S. air traffic since September 11, 2001. Even with the FAA systems fully restored, the ripple effects are expected to last for several days, perhaps until the weekend. It's going to take time for the airlines to get their schedules back on track and their planes properly positioned. Jackson Prosco, Global News, Arlington, Virginia. There is more information on the situation here in Canada. And Gaviola is with me from Toronto. And the NOTAM system that alerts pilots to potential hazards failed here in Canada today too. What can you tell us about that? Yeah, NAVCAN tells me that we saw a brief outage to new entries into our NOTAM system today. It started at 10.20 a.m. Eastern Time. It lasted about three hours, but there were mitigations put in place so that operations could continue, and there will be an investigation to try and figure out what the root cause of that was, although it's not believed to be related to what happened in the U.S. And a lot of people may be wondering, why was the impact so different here in Canada? There are a lot of factors to consider, including the fact that we've had up Upgrades to our systems. So what we're dealing with here is uh, systems that are not as antiquated as what they have in the U.S. And there's also the fact that Canadian airspace is a lot less complicated than what they have south of the border in terms of the sheer number of flights, but also we have less major international hubs. Donna? All right. And there's already been so much disruption and to airline travel recently. Is it likely to get any better in 2023? 
I'm afraid I don't have great news on that front, and uh, air travelers should probably pack a lot of patience. What we know is that a lot of uh, workers have left the industry, and now what we're dealing with is labor shortages. You can see that at airports, you can see it on airlines, and also a lot of those new recruits are still being onboarded and trained. So what that means is it's likely to have an exacerbating effect when there are major weather-related events or major events like we saw south of the border. Donna. All right. And Gaviola in Toronto. Thank you. In California, there's a brief break in the rain, but millions of people are bracing for what's coming next. Weeks of rain have left entire subdivisions submerged. More than half of California's 58 counties have been declared disaster areas. Even a few inches of water can do a lot of damage, leaving ankle-deep muddy water as people salvage what they can from their homes. Heather Urex West reports on the cleanup and the new round of brutal storms on the way. Entire communities are submerged in California. The latest in a series of powerful storms came on so quickly, for some their only escape was by air. I told my wife, we better get ready. And we started packing and getting ready. And we were looking out the window and then we saw the bridge go. And when that bridge went, there's no way out. With a break in the forecast Wednesday, residents of Southern California began to clean up while thunderstorms led a new atmospheric river into the northern part of the state. This is the Bay Area, San Francisco Bay Area. We're getting another storm right now. And the mountainous Sierra County saw another 15 centimeters of snow. Snowpack in the high mountains is 200 to 300 percent above April 1st averages. So there's going to be a delayed effect as well going into the spring of snowmelt that's uh, going to be have to managed as well. But for now, these storm systems aren't finished yet. Southern California is expected to see more wet weather starting this weekend. The state's governor warning it will be a difficult week ahead. We expect a minimum three more of these atmospheric rivers in different shapes and forms, depending on different parts of the state. At least 17 people have been killed while the search continues for five-year-old Kyle Doan, who was swept away Monday as rescuers tried to pull him and his mother from raging floodwaters. The loss of life and property so far has been devastating. We lost our home and all of our like, belongings that we had. The extreme weather, a product of climate change that only seems to be getting worse. Heather Urex West, Global News. Aides to the American President Joe Biden have discovered more classified documents. They were found in a location separate from the Washington office he used after leaving the Obama administration. It's unclear exactly where they were, though, how many there are and what level of classification they are, nor do we know when they were discovered. Biden says he is fully cooperating with the Justice Department review. Biden's personal lawyers revealed earlier this week they discovered about 10 files, some marked top secret, in a locked closet in his Washington office of the think tank, the Penn Biden. Biden Center. U.S. federal law prohibits knowingly removing classified information and retaining it in an unauthorized location. Canada's relationship with Mexico was top of mind for Prime Minister Justin Trudeau today. He met with his Mexican counterpart at the North American Leaders Summit. Mackenzie Gray breaks down what they talked about and Canada's takeaways at the so-called Three Amigos meeting in Mexico City. On his final day in Mexico, Justin Trudeau turned his attention to the other amigo. Mexican President Andres Manuel López Obrador and the Prime Minister focusing on trade. We will continue to talk about how we can even further uh, increase our economic partnership. And finding common ground on opposing protectionist Buy America policies from U.S. President Joe Biden. That's their common interest. They want to buy North American policy. And there have been positive developments there. But the Mexicans have their own protectionist rules, with Lopez Obrador nationalizing several Mexican energy companies. That's drawn the iron of Canadian firms who do business in Mexico. But the president told Trudeau he's willing to work to solve the issue. They want to portray themselves both as allies of the broader North American project and not caught up in petty discussions about one industrial sector or another. But it's a request from the other amigo that's shown minor cracks in North American unity. Trudeau turning down Joe Biden's ask to have Canada lead a security force in troubled Haiti. Canada today backing up its support for local police by airlifting Haitian purchased armored vehicles to Port-au-Prince. But when pushed on Biden's proposal, 
should have left the door open to acquiescing to the Americans. Preparing various scenarios if it does start to get worse. But we also know that right now, what is effective is empowerment of the Haitian National Police to solve the situation themselves. Justin Trudeau flies back to Canada tonight, wrapping up his three-day trip to Mexico, and he'll continue meeting with world leaders tomorrow, Donna, when the Japanese Prime Minister is set to visit Parliament Hill. All right, Mackenzie Gray in Ottawa, thank you. The situation in Haiti has unraveled even further. The terms of the last 10 senators who were remaining in office expired last night, and that's left a political vacuum. The Caribbean nation is now without a single democratically elected government official. Organized crime groups have been running virtually unchecked since the summer of 2021, when the former president was assassinated. Two-thirds of Haiti's capital, Port-au-Prince, is now estimated to be under the control of warring gangs, and a record 4.7 million people are said to be facing acute hunger. Prime Minister Ariel Henry is still there, but he was never elected and is seen by most Haitians as illegitimate. Ukraine has released footage of what it says are Russian troops under fire in the eastern town of Solodar. The video appears to refute Russian claims it took control of the small salt mining town yesterday. Ukraine says the fighting is intensifying, with forces firing howitzers at Russian positions. Solodar is key to accessing the nearby city of Bakhmut, which has held out for months against the Russians. The area is in Donetsk, one of the four regions Russia illegally annexed last year. In his latest address, Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky mocked Russia for suggesting the fighting had stopped. Off-duty police officers are being praised for quickly apprehending an armed attacker at a Paris train station. During the early morning rush hour at Gare du Nord, investigators say six people, including a police officer, were injured when a man came after them with a metal hook. Within a minute, police say the officers, returning from their night shift, shot and arrested the suspect. He's in the hospital and a criminal investigation is underway. It happened at one of the busiest train stations in France. In the Afghan capital, a suicide bomb attack outside the foreign ministry has caused heavy casualties. Kabul police say at least five civilians were killed. Taliban officials put the death toll as high as 20. The local offshoot of the Islamic State group has claimed it carried out the attack. Lobster fishing rights for Indigenous people. Coming up, a new ruling from a Nova Scotia judge and what it could mean. Plus, the young piano prodigy who's never had a music lesson. There's a development in the ongoing conflict over Indigenous fishing rights in Nova Scotia. A provincial court judge has ruled in favour of three Mi'kmaq fishermen accused of illegally catching lobster. That has First Nations harvesters hopeful there's a new level of respect for their treaty rights and optimistic the tense, sometimes violent confrontations with some commercial fishermen will end. Ross Lord explains. Frightening confrontations and devastating property damage seen in 2020 have now given way to court action. On Monday, a Nova Scotia court acquitted Mi'kmaq harvester James Nevin and two others of charges they violated the Fisheries Act. Well, it means a lot. It means a lot to all Mi'kmaq people. The men are from the Sabaganagati First Nation. Their lawyer argued they were simply exercising court-protected treaty rights to a moderate livelihood rights that exempt them from government regulations. In acquitting the men, provincial court judge Timothy Landry said, in order for me to know that the fishermen possess fish that were caught contrary to the Fisheries Act, I have to know they don't have the authority to fish in any other fashion, which I don't. Nevin says the ruling eases his emotional distress. You know, I sank into um, like a a type of depression thinking about this case, you know, uh, consistently. And, but I mean, it's a good way to start off the, uh, the new year by, you know, every, everything being dismissed. The lack of evidence suggests DFO enforcement was ineffective. But the Fisher's defense lawyer considers the ruling a turning point. I think it's going to have a domino effect, plus I'm going to start an action against the Department of Fisheries I'm over, on behalf of my clients. It seems some First Nations are going along with the government. Out of 35 in Atlanta, Canada and Gaspé, Quebec, DFO says it's reached interim understandings allowing eight First Nations to fish and sell their catch during the DFO-established commercial seasons without increasing overall fishing effort. 
Commercial fishers say out-of-season lobster landings could deplete stocks. Indigenous fishers say that's impossible because they have smaller boats and far fewer traps. With consensus still out of reach, a commercial fishing group suggests the courts are indeed a more practical resort. I guess there's a potential that Sebag and Aidy and the UFCA would both like to see this case resolved in the Supreme Court. That would be one, uh, one point of agreement. Similar cases are scheduled to be heard in coming weeks, providing either more clarity or complication. Ross Lord, Global News, Shubenacadie, Nova Scotia. Ontario Premier Doug Ford has confirmed his government will fight a court decision to certify a class action lawsuit that relates to COVID-19 deaths in Ontario's long-term care homes. Thousands of residents died as a result of the virus, especially in the early stages of the pandemic. The suit claims the province was grossly negligent in failing to prevent those fatalities. Ford admits the virus presented challenges, but says it was the same around the world, and he says Ontario performed better than most other places. Piano prodigy ahead, the young boy who is stunning everyone with his talent. That is 11-year-old Jude Kofi, a self-taught pianist who plays like he's had years of lessons. Jude, who has autism, stunned his family when he started playing his dad's old keyboard in the basement. He plays by ear. He's never had a lesson. I was inspired. I was inspired by God. I never stopped. Always on and on and on and on. Yeah. Three hours a day. A piano tuner who describes Jude as a Mozart-level talent bought him a grand piano as a surprise, and now he's learning to read music. Jude's father, originally from Ghana, says he hoped to make a career of music himself, but ended up working two jobs to support his family in the U.S. and back in Ghana. His son looks set to follow his dream. I love that smile. The music world is mourning a loss today. Jeff Beck, often described as one of the greatest guitarists of all time, has died. He played with the Yardbirds and the Jeff Beck group and worked with the likes of Rod Stewart. Beck was an innovator who pioneered distinct and distorted guitar sounds heard in many music genres today, from jazz to heavy metal. His fingers and thumbs were insured for $9 million. Beck won eight Grammys. He was inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame twice. He died on Tuesday after contracting bacterial meningitis. He was 78 years old. Girl Guides of Canada has renamed the Brownies. The program for girls aged 7 and 8 will now be called Embers. The organization says it made the change to create more inclusive spaces where racialized girls can feel welcome and proud. After an online vote, Embers was chosen over the second place name, Comets. Leading a new life next, two teenagers from Afghanistan making the most of their new opportunity in Canada. Going to the mall or having a part-time job are things most Canadian teenagers take for granted. But for new Canadians who have fled oppressive or war-torn regimes, simple things like that are exceptional. Six living in Afghanistan have faced decades of religious persecution, the majority of them fleeing the country. Some have come to Canada as refugees. And as Neetu Garcha reports, they're making the most of their newfound freedom. Chandan is in the orange there. 13-year-old <laughs> Chandar and 15-year-old Jaspal Khalsa can't help but giggle watching videos of themselves in 2015, what they consider a happy time, having just fled Afghanistan for India, where they had become refugees. What do you think when you see this? It's a like flashback. They were among hundreds of six who were given an ultimatum. Either convert to Islam or accept death. I feel a second chance in my life, like God gifted me a second chance. Chaspal came to Canada this past spring. The grade 10 student works part-time at a local restaurant and hopes to become a nurse. My mother told me, you are, you are very lucky to you, you, have, you live in Canada now. Yeah, you have be very beautiful future in Canada. Jandar has been here since 2019. The grade 8 student says she loves shopping, a very different experience from Afghanistan where she could hardly leave her home. My father. 
father and brother they go to outside and they call us and show us uh, what you want to buy. Now she dreams of becoming a chef. When I first met these girls, they were hiding behind their moms and their moms were hiding behind their husbands. BC resident Hamrit Baines traveled to India where she spent months helping families as they awaited private sponsorship to this country. Baines was inspired by former Alberta cabinet minister Manmeet Buller. In 2015, Buller learned the plight of persecuted Hindu and Sikh families in Afghanistan who had tried for years to come to Canada. He worked tirelessly to help them through his passion for selfless service. He treated them as his family. I, I know he had said, like, if I have to give everything I have, I will for these families. But he would never see the impact of his efforts. Just six months after starting, Buller died while trying to help a driver in distress. I and my family have no choice but to continue this work um, because it's so tied closely to the man that we love. Buller's sister Thurjinder helped create the foundation in his name. She says they've helped bring more than 200 Afghans to Canada and committed to supporting at least 500 more. It's the next generation of people that hopefully will see that they have a life here in Canada because someone halfway around the world started to think about how can I help them. And message for the other girls, if you want anything, you can do anything. <laughs> Generational change, they hope, will continue to be paid forward. Neetu Garcha, Global News, Delta, B.C. And that is Global National for this Wednesday. I'm Donna Friesen. Tonight's Euro Canada is Morant's Curve in Banff National Park, where the CP rail line runs along the Bow River, a beautiful spot. We'd love to see Euro Canada. Please email it to viewers at globalnational.com. And thanks for watching. Hope to see you here again tomorrow. Bye bye.